Yeah, this is Development Review Board Burnick in January 16th. Um, we are on Zoom and live. Um, and just uh, we'll say we take up items that they are on the agenda as they are on the agenda. And uh, when we call items, we ask people, the applicant and anybody else who's going to speak on it to um, sign in. Um, on Zoom, identify yourselves as you care. We have a sign in sheet. Uh, and we'll take testimony on oath as appropriate. And so our first item is a sent an item agenda. Yes, it is uh, 362 Riverside. Is the applicant is online, I believe, right? Yes, Benjamin Avery for the applicant. Okay, so this is listed as a consent item. Um, have you seen the staff report and are you okay with it as consent? Yes. Okay. Uh, anybody on the board object to treating this as a consent item? No? Okay. Is there anybody in the public who uh, wishes to speak on 362 Riverside? No. Okay. So uh, can I have a motion on for a town extension on uh, existing proof permits? I did actually have just one question on it. Um, I know this was already approved for the extension. I saw that there is a bike parking area, but that there's no number of spaces or design considerations for that. Is that uh, is that going to be compliant with all of the minimum bike parking requirements uh, currently in ordinance, as well as the construction of those bike parking? Accommodations. We're not, uh, really uh, we're not really reviewing the application at this point, and it okay. has approval. And I don't know how that wording is in the approval. Uh, okay. We're not opening that back up. I'm going to leave it at that. Okay. Uh, if that's not the case, then yeah, I'm fine with moving it forward to the extension. Uh, so moved. So moved. Second. Case. All in favor? Evan, I, are you? I am. Okay. The item passes five to zero, Mr. Avery. Thank you, Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the time, however brief it was. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is the Apple Tree Point, and the applicant has requested uh, has a requested defer. Is that to a date certain? Or is that it is. It's the, it will be the first meeting in February. They did not have their stormwater plan ready for conservation board. Conservation board only meets once a month. So they're both the February 5th conservation board and they can be ready February 6th for this board. Okay. So can I have a motion to uh defer this to that February meeting? So so we'll Second chase. <laughs> okay. All in favor? Evan? Evan. Aye. Okay. What's Aye. what's your cohort's name there, Evan? Julian. Julian. No, she she's not he he or she? He he, he is he is currently getting changed. Okay. <laughs> He's not voting He's not okay. in the book. <laughs> okay. Next item is Shelburne Street um, says uh, 165 Shelburne Street, Champagne Housing Trust, uh, proposed renovation of existing facility. Is the applicant here? Brett, I'm recused from the side. Jeff is recused. We're going to come up to the. Did anybody else? Uh, I got one of the first ones coming, but they're not uh, Mike Quaid. I think we can get started. Okay. Um, is there anybody? Do we have anybody in the public, Mary? Um, we we do. Is there anybody in the public interested in speaking on one six uh one sixty uh one sixty five Children Street? I see Sharon Busher has her hand up. Sharon, are you going to be speaking on this? Just giving her. Up. Sharon, uh, would you like to speak on this matter? You're muted. Uh, 
Oh. You're oh. unmuted for a moment. Yeah. She's not there any longer. <laughs> oh, it's just our memo. Hello. Uh, are, you are, are you speaking <laughs> no. on uh, Something you happened. Know? You made me as a panelist. That's what happened. Anyways, yes, I would like to speak, okay. but I, I'm going to be leaving at 530. So if my time hasn't come up, I won't be able to speak. And that's OK. I'd like to swear you in and you are Donald Dugan, Champlain House Trust. Trust. Amy Dimitrowitz, also Champlain House and Trust, is on her way. But we won't swear her in, but she's here. So do both of you swear to tell the truth and hold the truth on the pain and battle of your burglary? Baron? Yes, okay. I do. So, you want to uh, give an overview of what we're looking at? Um, sure. I guess we could pull up the the application packet there. I can start walking you through it. I I will say that I found I I want to just that I found the application very confusing. Um, it's very piecemeal. It's very hard to get a sense of the overview of what's being asked and presented. So I, I see it has the project has been incrementally changing. If you as can the, make it clear, that would be great. I think uh <clears throat> is there one plan you would prefer? I think that the, the PDF that was the board packet was. I thought was was pretty complete. Sorry, that my screen just went down. Oh, okay. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> I, I'll remember not to touch the screen. Maybe you could give an overview, Donald. Uh, so the verbal overview is it's a 1950s hotel. Um, uh, a third floor was added in 1979. Um, we purchased this building in uh, six months ago. We took it over from a new place because uh, they could no longer manage it. Um, we're operating it as a hotel that is a shelter for homeless uh, people experiencing homelessness. Um, we are getting money from Vermont Housing Conservation Board. Uh, so CHC is owning the property. Um, CVOEO is operating the shelter. Um, and we'll be, we have a MOU with them for uh, three years of operation, or two years of operation. I'm not exactly sure about that. Um, and we've gotten some money from uh, BHCB to do some renovations. Um, there is the hotel building, and then there is the. Well, Mary's allowed to touch the screen. It's the just got lucky. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so uh, there's a there's a house, uh, the old house here, um, and uh, there was a hotel. There was a pool that is already been filled in. Was filled in. Five years ago or so, um, and is that grass now or is it hardscape? Right now, this the dotted lines are existing uh, concrete. The the pool apron is still there. They just dumped dirt in the pool, and uh, <laughs> so this is the current office. Originally, we were proposed to put the office over here, but the staff, after you know having operated it for. Uh, a few months have decided that they'd rather keep the office where it is, but we wanted to make a bit of a vestibule entry. Um, we are planning on sprinkling the building, which is not required by code, strangely enough, but because they exit directly to the exterior, the building, that's why all the hotels are like that with an open circulation is to avoid sprinkling, but we don't want to serve this population without a sprinkler for you know, obvious reasons. Um, so we're planning on sprinkling this building, but to sprinkle that building and not this one, then we need to, uh, uh, we need to disconnect this here. So, um, so there's, uh, and then this is the, this is the um, guest laundry over here. And uh, currently 
and we're just be expanding that slightly. And the, but we need an accessible route across there, and we need an accessible route to the offices. You're so, tearing something down. What's that? There's a there's a a roof, uh, a roof over here that is. This is actually the ridge runs this way. It's a very odd little. It's just a little vestibule thing that goes in between there. Picture up. Yeah, one of the one of the PDFs in there has the. Yeah, we just had it the, uh, there. Yeah, so this is this this outline here that I've cut away for this drawing, is uh, where that roof is currently. So there's basically just an enclosed vestibule that is was probably an open vestibule at one point, but it's been enclosed more and more over time. And so we're just going to. Well, what we really need to do for the site to operate it properly is we have to control access because having uncontrolled access is a nightmare in a situation like that. So we need to have some way to get people to come in through a single entry. And um, so that's what we're gonna you know, use the vestibule for is to create the, the entry into the, um, control the entry into the into the property, then the office will be just to the side and they can- You have a gate and fence though too. We have a gate in the fence because we want to have some sort of way to, if you know, if emergency services needs to come in, we want to have some way for them to be able to open up and you know get direct access. So that's the um, um what else? So then this would be where the covered bike storage would be. With the you know we just instead of having this slope roof, we would just have a piece of flat roof that would cover up the. Um, the little five by 16 entry that we would do on the office. And then the rest of the, this existing concrete block wall would be create the, um, uh, the covered porch essentially that would uh, cover the bikes. So we had some bike, um, so we have covered bike parking because that's what our guests are using for transportation at and the public bus. Not a single, there's one broken down car on the property that is a guest and doesn't move very often. Um, what other things? Um, so there's a, oh, on that one there. Uh, I guess was gonna, is, if other things to explain. Let's go back to the floor plans, just so we can walk through those. Um, I guess it's not really that much to show in these in that, you know, basically all these bathrooms, all the drains and all the bathrooms are not in great shape um, or in horrible shape. And so we need to replace all that. So there's, you know, about 30 bathrooms that need to be done. Um, the other thing is, um, so this is the, uh, depending on which side you're on. So there's, there's a steep grade change. So from the front in the 1950s, that building was two stories. They added the third story. So now it's three stories in the front and really four stories from the back. And there's really not a picture of it because you can't really get back far enough to see it. And there's full grown, you know, four story tall cedars in the back. So I can't really even get a picture from uh, another location. So, um, so that back to that. So on the back side of here, there's some decks overlooking uh, some back decks. We need to maintain, we want to maintain those for um, we need to have that as a, a secondary means of egress is to have uh, those are their sliders currently. If you go to that uh, that floor plan that had the um, the fourth floor there. Uh, one one back. Yeah, this one here. So we need to um, right now this is all one big open deck. And as you can imagine, uh, there can be disputes between people on that deck. And before, you know, before we took over the property, um, there were some issues about people on the decks shouting at the neighbors kind of thing. Um, that hasn't happened to them any time in the past couple of years, even really since, since the new took it over even, they've had that under control. But still, the, you know, I talked to the neighbors and, you know, they're not, they're not really that comfortable with somebody sitting out on their deck and, you know, looking down into the, you know, into their property. 
So the neighbors would like it to be an opaque railing. And from our standpoint, we've got um, tenants or residents, sorry, guests. I can't remember what property we're on. Guests who, um, you know, might be having a mental health crisis, you know, various other situations. And we want to make sure that there's a solid railing that is, you know, four feet high and um, uh, also it's like in, in trauma-informed design, we want to create a, a safe, you know, safe space, right? They want to feel enclosed, you know, that's why you see some people are putting tin foil over their windows and that sort of stuff is that, you know, a lot of the population just really wants to be, you know, enclosed. So, um, so we'd like, so we're proposing subdividing these um, porches and then creating a solid railing on the back to create more enclosure around those, those, those porches. So, 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 those are walls, so those are the new walls. Uh, these walls would be full height. So we would go floor to ceiling. The, the, the floor to floor height in this building is very, very low. There is really only, it's, it's really less than eight feet. There's really not the structure of the building that originally was concrete block walls and then the decking is three inch T and G decking. That is the entire floor structure, 12 foot six clear span. So yeah, <laughs> so there's it's a very short floor to floor. Then the third floor, they just, looks like they just tore off the old roof and then they, you know, put in some two by eights or something like that, but it's still a very, pretty short and floor to railing, floor. Railing, railing, is that the corrugated? Yeah, I was I was proposing a, a corrugated metal as the railing material because I want something that's fireproof. And is there's a roof that's getting removed someplace? There is a there's um I guess if you show one of the section the elevations of the photographs you can see the well it was back on that one too but that one here so there was this thing was here these little sunshade things. On the top floor here, they've converted that to a roof, but it was never engineered to be have a roof on it. It was just, you know, had some, at one point probably had, you know, two by fours on edge as a sun shading structure. So this current setup as having a piece of roof here is, is not engineered as such. Um, yeah, that's all, that's those things there. The siding on that side is the wood siding. So yeah, the siding, if you go to that, there's a picture, there's only one picture that shows a gable end. Even. What's that? The south end. Oh, that one. Full south end. These are all, uh, so. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> The next one. And so this is this is the the first and second floor are uh I you know I don't really know what the original siding was because you know we don't really there's no um, description in the documents, but that first and second, or yeah, first and second floors would be, uh, is um, board and batten. The third floor is all shiplap. So if you go to any of the detail, anything that shows the, that, oh, that one there showed it. So we got board and batten, board and batten, that one here. So this, this whole level up here, is all shiplap. And is that staying? Well, I'm proposing replacing this with um, a more durable material or something, because this is really almost five floors up. So getting to this, so they painted the other side of the building, but they didn't paint this side because you have to put a lift on the other neighbor's property to get up there and probably do some tree clearing to get up there because it's just, it's almost inaccessible. That's where you suggest parking. That's why that's why I was trying to come up with something that was vertical and low maintenance. And I could do, you know, a vertical vinyl, 
but that stuff looks awful. And so really that, that's how I landed on, on the metal was something was vertical and low maintenance. Excuse me, but um, I'm also here with the Champlain House. Yes, I just... Long for being late. <laughs> well, we didn't know. We thought we were second, but we were first. Please swear you in and say yeah. your name and tell the truth, the whole truth on the pain of the penalty of perjury. Yes, I do. My name is Amy Demetrowitz. I'm also with the Champlain Housing yeah. Trust. And I just wanted to speak to that issue because this is the one section that appears is an adverse finding in the staff report. Um, I don't know that we've talked about the sign. That was the second issue. We can talk yeah. about that. But this um, side, it, again, it's just the south side at the fourth floor that you cannot see from the street because the house that's up along the street kind of blocks any kind of view and very overgrown with many, many trees that are on our neighbor's property. So you cannot see this site, this side. It's very, very difficult to access because our property line is almost up against the building. So for us to get up there and regularly maintain will be a negotiation with our neighbor, um, which is why Donald was looking at a more durable, maintenance-free material and to keep the verticality of what you've got there with the shiplap siding. Um, but then we can put it up there. We won't have to deal with maintaining it for a long time. The alternative, if you feel like that really will compromise the historic character, is that we can try to go up there with a lift, scrape and repair as best we can and leave it, but it'll likely look like that again in you know three, three to five years. And you won't be able to do that. You won't be able to get the lift out there and go up five stories every three to five years. Would there be uh, alternative materials for vertical installation, like the cementitious type of work? Our understanding is they don't make the cementitious um, for as a shiplap. No, they don't make like a shiplap or a or a board batten in the in the cementitious siding. Um, they do have like a vinyl siding that's vertical. Um, it felt like the metal was the preferable to the vinyl. Yeah, I, you know, in the and just labor wise in, in the install and all that sort of stuff is just the you know the metal is a sheet good you can get as long as you want and uh you know board and batten is going to be you know a lot more pieces putting up there you know a, a difficult uh waterproofing detail um so it just uh the other vertical siding option is like a t111 right you know that that won't really hold up there yeah. it's not not really made it's really durable so that's that was the um, you know coming to the to the metal corrugated siding, mm -hmm. um, but again, if it feels like it's you know really going to compromise the historic character, we disagree that it will. Just given where it is, given the lack of visibility from any public way, um, we just feel really really strongly that it, it, it's not going to compromise. And also that addition, that top floor was built in 1979, so it's also not a historic component of the existing structure. So That's our argument in, in favor of the metal side. The existing south uh, west side, existing west side is board and batten. Right. The, the existing floor. west side on the first two floors, the 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 presumed 1950s area is board and batten. And the third floor is the same T and G. Is yeah, is a uh, it looks like it's a shiplap. But you can't oh, it's a shiplap. But yeah. you can you feel you can maintain that one where it's this on the west on the south side here. You can't mean I, I just can't get to it. Yeah. I mean I and the so and what the, I'm I'm I, I guess I'll just step back and it's hard not to see, maybe I, I may not have a good picture of this. It's hard not to see this as a real hodgepodge of dealing with a problem here, a problem there, and this and that. And in the end, it's gonna look really bad. Um, and maybe I'm wrong, but I, it's hard to get an impression that you've really got an overall sense that you're going to make this building, you're repairing this building, and it's going to have some sense of a whole when you're done. Am I wrong? Oh, I, I would argue, the, especially the front facade, which is publicly visible, we're not really making a lot of changes. We're making some changes to make it more functional for the use that it has now. On the south facade, we're just looking to make that change because it's a more durable, maintainable material. On the back, it, the top floor, we're going to um, make that a more solid rail again for functionality. I don't know. Is that I, I, honestly? I think the building right now is kind of hodgepodge. It was built in the '50s, and then there was the addition that was built in 1979. So, and then you're putting a six-foot high vinyl fence in front of it. That's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
uh, yes, side. on the front yeah. side of the parking lot. Right, so, so, I mean, that contributes to the sense that, you know, yeah. I, it's, it is, it is a place where I got to prioritize, you know, the, the bathrooms in this place are, I, I, they're unlivable. I mean, the, the, a lot of the interior spaces are really unlivable and I got to produce, I got to preserve my budget for these things that are absolutely essential for housing and, you know, keeping our, you know, guests in a, you know, in a safe and, you know, sanitary environment. And it's just uh, those, uh, you, know, you know, we we like to do things that are good looking, but I don't always have that opportunity. Is your is your concern with the vinyl material or is it with creating a fenced in courtyard? My concern is that it's really gonna look like this is done as cheaply as possible. And we're just trying to house a bunch of people that we don't really care about. That's, I know that's not the actor, but that's what I'm, that's what I'm afraid it's gonna look like when we're all said and done. There's no landscaping that's visible to anything. There's nothing done to soften the place. It, it just is doing the minimum that you can do to make it work. I understand that financially this problem. You know, I guess. You know, actually, the reason that we're doing that courtyard is to make it softer because people. Well, the people, they're, they're the people, people yeah. They yeah. yeah. need privacy. They want outdoor, private outdoor space. Yeah. And not feeling like they're on display. Like, um, you don't have a landscaping plan, but the intention is to remove the that sign in the front. Yeah. Um, and, and to get to that issue of adverse uh, finding about the sign, uh, we will reduce that height yeah, to six feet, high. no problem at all, six yeah. feet. Um, but we'll be removing that sign bed um, and making some, you know, cleaning up essentially that um, landscape island in the front. The rest of the, the front is really all paved. Yeah. That I, kind of does seem to have Sharon waiting, and we have someone else with their hand up. I know Sharon was could only be available until 5 30. She said, Do you want to allow her to talk? And I have another gentleman who can stand up. So we'll take some public comments. I'm sorry to interrupt. Sharon, uh, would you like to provide comment? Um, I I feel like the the DRB hasn't finished their exploration, so I feel odd doing this. But my only comments were that, um, and and you're getting to some of this. I attended the DAB meeting where there were, um, I, I really wanted to applaud the DAB. They really tried to, and there were two meetings, they really tried to work with this applicant to, um, and I know it's affordable housing and I know it's an important housing and I understand the limitations of budget, but the, I understand you also don't get the details of the DAB minutes, which is unfortunate because a, a lot of people with a lot of skills, just like yourselves, came forward with what they felt were some um, really responsible and not, um, not breaking the bank recommendations that were not actually entertained. There was the first meeting, some recommendations came forward, the applicant came back and made no changes. And I agree with your statement that, um, that, you know, I've lived in Burlington a long time and I know about rental property, not this type of housing, but I do know about this type of housing now. But anyways, um, I think that the where people live and, um, and how it looks really gives them pride and makes them feel valued. And I, I don't think that can be underscored. And so I'm very disappointed that the applicant wasn't able to um, take some of the suggestions made by the DAB to make enhancements to this that were structurally sound. And I'm not an architect, but I, I was very disappointed that there was no resolution and that the DAB ultimately ended up saying, um, denying this uh, project. And so that's, those are my comments. Um, I don't have, I'm not an architect, but I'm disappointed. And I really felt that there could be some things done structurally to make the building look better and still keep it um, affordable. So that's it. Thank you so much for making time for me. Thank you, Sharon. Um, so maybe we can finish the board comments. I... Yes, I'm sorry to have interrupted. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah no, I was just had a comment about this the, the privacy fence going along the front of the six foot mile fence. It just seems that uh, traveling along at, uh, at that section just before you get to the boundary, this is a real highly visible place. And so I didn't want that to be something that shocked people. I was wondering, would you, would you have say considered something different there to uh, like maybe landscaping instead of a fence? Um, to to afford some privacy there, uh, it would look a little nicer. There there are all there are certain types of drugs that could put there that would act both as privacy and a barrier. Um, so there, that's a suggestion on, on my part. And I also want to know if if uh, you have consulted um, fire and safety or the fire marshal on that. How they feel about being able to access inside that area. I have had conversations with the fire marshal and discussed with them about. If they're happy with it, I'm happy with yeah, it. But just yeah. want to make sure that gets done. Yeah, I mean, we we did a truck turn for the for the diagram for the for his um, for the truck, um, and you know, we sent them the drawing and asked for his feedback. Yeah, yes, he gets it. We've been in conversations about this. Property several times. So. And there is a double gate access into the courtyard area. Um, the other reason that we have that fence proposed is to um, maintain security. So, mm -hmm. in terms of doing more of the landscape, I get your point, it would be softer, but um, it would also be more porous. Um, there, there are issues with having every single door at the, every single room is sort of accessible to anybody who kind of comes on site. And so the staff, in terms of managing the site, really wants more control access so that they can see who's coming and going instead of having someone come around, you know, go through the bushes and get right. into one of the upstairs rooms. And um, so there's really two purposes to that courtyard and to the fence in particular. I have a question. Um, who's speaking? Kaylee. Kaylee. Um, okay, let's go ahead. Sorry, I'm I'm homesick today. I didn't want to infect all of you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> With the fence that um, we were just talking about, I didn't see any note about clear sight lines, but this is going through the driveway. So doesn't it need to be reduced to three feet within the clear sight line triangles? It's parallel to the building. It's way back. It's set off way back off the road. So it's not an entire. It's not on the property line. It's it's uh, twenty feet off the building, which the building is sixty feet off the road. Caitlin, do you have? Can you see the the site plan? Uh, got it. Okay, so, so it's got fire one lane, no parking. That's where the the cursor is now. That's where the fence is is proposed. So it sits quite a bit back. But it fully encloses the main link fence goes all the way to the front of the property, correct? Yeah, and, and the other issue is the fire department said many times to us that they do not want people smoking too close to the building. So I'm trying to move, you know, I know that I need to have a smoking area and so I need to move that farther away from the building. So that's sort of like the, some of the push-pull on, on the front courtyard. Um, Perhaps you could do a combination of uh, fence and some landscaping there. I mean, to get the, the, the truck turn is just enough room there to get the truck and come in there and turn. That's the, I would say that on the landscaping piece, um, my experience with these sorts of situations is that I can get, so we've got one staff member we've just, that's now taking the charge of the building, who's a master gardener. And I would love to be able to give him free reign to you know make landscaping improvements over you know, over the you know as we come into the spring and things like that um and i will give them you know we will you know provide them funds to do that it's just me specifying those things at this point is is often a losing battle there's often I, i'm specifying things that aren't appropriate or they don't know anything about or you know i know that the CBOEO is really big on, um, you know, they run the food shelf and they really like to do some garden beds. And so they're talking about doing raised beds along the back. And, uh, so I think 
I, I think there will be uh, more softening. Uh, but part of the other issue is right now they're plowing all the snow onto the south end of the site. And I don't think that's really, uh, so right now they're plowing, they just push all the snow over to here and and fill up all these parking spots and this and you know essentially push it over into our neighbor's property and I don't think I think we really need to plow onto these you know green belt areas to allow for some infiltration and that sort of stuff so you know some of it is I want to give time for us to see where the plowing goes so that we aren't planting something and then killing it with a snow plow so um the other uh, other element we didn't really talk about was you know we, sorry right I can't now, see I can't see where you're pointing to, but oh, were sorry. you saying one, two, three, four, five, six for yes. basically yeah. where they're plowing and then the green belt being that like section kind of on the east side of the. Yeah. So I've plowed it in an area for, for, for snow storage there, which is pretty much the only place that I've got that's actually a, would be a, a viable snow storage area. The other thing I just wanted to talk about was we did currently the the dumpsters are right in the front yard. And that's obviously not in compliance with the, the rules. So we have moved everything over to here. Um, and then we'll be using this. Um, this is our driveway shared with a neighbor. Uh, so that was uh, a little expensive pill to swallow because this is, um, you know, not as not as effective or not as easy access as over there. But this will be the tote storage area. I would also say that our, our focus really is on making it a comfortable place for the people who are staying there. Um, so there are a lot of improvements planned that are going to make the, um, the experience of staying there much more comfortable, including um, adding a, a lift in the, to the home, the single family home on the front, so that we can provide more services there that are accessible. Um, and then all of the upgrades that Donald's talked about in terms of plumbing and flooring and Heating, cooling. That's where that's where a lot of our focus is. It's really on making it a, a comfortable and dignified place to stay. I I, I know that CHG has a great reputation for doing exactly that throughout the city in many many projects. It's also sort of a moral dilemma because there's a lot of examples of projects done in the '60s where public housing projects where they said. Well, we don't have to worry about aesthetics. We're going to give them a good place to live. And those places have all been torn down and destroyed because they were unlivable. I'm not saying that it's going to happen here, but that's sort of the, you know, that aesthetic end of things, which seems so superfluous, isn't really that superfluous. I guess my point is we're not making that many changes to the building. Do you think that the building is unattractive now? I, I think putting the fence in front of the building makes a statement that we're walling this thing off and we've got nothing, you know, there's no lens, nothing, we're just adding a fence here and whatever happens behind that, we're just throwing people back there. That's what it feels like. I know that that's not the intention. Yeah, um, I, I think, think so that people can have some privacy, be outside, yeah. have a cigarette, be, be private, um, and yeah. then also to control that access so that anybody who's staying there doesn't feel like Anybody yeah. on the street can call. I absolutely understand that yeah. quality of life thing that yes. is the way to do that. Yeah. 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 It, it's really our yeah. focus is sort of inside out. And the and the out is, you know, the, the residents don't, they're not, they're not interacting with that in that sort of way. I mean, I I spent a lot of time on the property and met the people and you know, see the struggles that are happening. And I've been in the rooms and I you know, I could barely get the electrical inspector to go into the rooms because they smell so bad. And it's just, it's, I really feel like we have to, you know, keep our focus on the, the interiors and the systems that need to be upgraded. And, you know, I, you know we make good looking buildings all the time and we would love to be able to, you know, make it aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing. But it's like it just doesn't make it on the list of us. I mean, just we're gonna try to be it as 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 thoughtful as possible, but there's you know other factors. 
But again, if it, it what you're saying, it comes down to that fence. And so are there other ways that we can, again, it's privacy and security. You always go to fence for privacy and security. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think just some landscaping can yeah. help I, you know, yeah. inside and outside of that, you know, whether it's yeah. a couple of cedars on the inside, a couple of cedars on the outside. Yeah. Start like in, in potted, we could do like potted plants because it's also all paved. Yeah. And we're not, yeah. you know, in a position to want to discover what might be underneath the pavement. You know, <laughs> we have, there are urban soils become an issue when we start digging into areas that we don't necessarily need to dig into. They're on the block too many times. Yes, yeah. yeah. but we could certainly look at, you know, adding some potted kind of cedars. I think the fence is really important yeah, to I those dual issues yeah. of security and privacy. Um, I do have someone else with them can raise when you're, if you're ready. That's Chase or Evan or Caitlin. Do you have any more questions for the applicant at this point? I'm all set. The only other thing I want to, I, I think, in terms of historic preservation, we're not really the issues. I don't think what the issues were with the historic preservation was. We're not deciding what's really in there. That was really exciting, and I just okay. I just tried to outline. Yeah. Okay. You know, in the if you look at the you know the, the original write up on the building, yeah, they don't even take a picture of the building. So it it was you know it was just describing the building as how it relates to the other quality buildings that they saw around it, and how it although <laughs> uh, what does it say although modern in design and set back from the line of residences. This conforms a color scheme and roof porch and roof motifs maintain height scale of surrounding buildings. So this the height and scale has totally changed because of you know, the addition of 1979. So it, it just there's nothing here that's calling out to saying like this is a historic element that we that was important when we wrote this thing down. And we weren't even actually talking about this building because we just drew an arrow on another picture to you know call it out so but again our intention is we're keeping all yeah. of the siding except for the south gable up on the fourth floor and wanting to replace that with a vertical more easily maintainable interrupted material but if that you know if you disagree then we can keep what's there and we'll do our best to scrape paint and repair um when, when i think of the type of siding i think of a, a very galvanized uh, steel the color of the not that way, right? It's a dark color of some sort. Um, it's sort of a, a, a steel color. Yeah, the color is, would just be the mill finish, which is just the. Yeah, so that's the, one thing that we, What'd you say, Chuck? That's you know, a large silver colored reflective like end of the building. Yeah, that might be. Yeah. Uh, look at, look at it's, silver. it's surprisingly not um, reflective when you see it in oh, place. Okay. It's more of a like. A modeled kind of, it's not like a shiny stainless steel kind yeah. of corrugated. It's galvanized steel. a little gray. Yeah, it's like a matte steel. gray. Yeah. It, it, the, the real issue is that it, you just, you just can't it. really see it from anywhere. Yeah. yeah. It's just not, you know, it was hard for me to find, get a get an angle to get a picture. And so it, it, it was, you know, if it was the front of the building, I guess it'd be a different discussion. A lot of the DAB discussion was about the design of the railing and you know wanting to mimic that screen on the front and it, it just wasn't it was We're talking about this south right. gable now you, you can't yeah. really see it I, I actually did print out from the street view i don't know if this is useful at all but there's no angle where you can see it at all from the public way our neighbor to the south can probably see it if they look through the trees but it's really not visible, and that's what makes it so difficult to maintain as well. Is one person from the public? Is that true? Yes. Who is that? Nicholas Barbiero. You're free to speak. Uh, and can I just uh, swear you in, Nicholas, um, that you would swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, on the pain and penalty of perjury? I do. Yeah. Okay. Uh and sorry, we have a sick baby, so apologies for the background noise. But um, yeah. I guess um, my wife and I are here, but we live directly behind um, the building and um, had a question regarding kind of the proposed smoking area. 
Um, I saw one document mention something about removing the smoking vestibule and kind of relegating smoking to kind of the back porches. Um, the reason I asked, when a new first opened, we, we kind of dealt with a lot of challenges um, at the beginning um, with a lot of secondhand smoke coming into our backyard, not being able to kind of open windows, um, a lot of noise because people are kind of out there at all hours smoking, and then just kind of a lot of like kind of trash being thrown in the backyard and cigarette butts. So I don't know if that's, if I was just hoping if you can clarify like what the proposed smoking area would be, if it's going to be allowed to be kind of on the back porches again, just because it created I, I just kind of a lot of like quality of life issues. That's a great question. Yeah. There is no smoking allowed in the building. The smoking shelter, and it's in now, isn't it? Yes, yeah. smoking shelter is in now, and it's, it's in the proximity of the location. Looks like a little bus shelter. It's on the there. front. It's on the front, the front of the building. building. Right. I think it, I might have been mistaken, but I thought one of the notes had said that that was to be removed, and that, and when you say that there's no smoking in the building, but I, I'm, I guess I'm talking about like kind of like for the the top floors have kind of like a like a back kind of patio thing. I'm wondering if it yeah, sets no, like people getting smoking to those areas. No smoking is allowed anywhere in the building or in those back porches. Okay, great. Okay. Um, and then the second question we had was there's a lot of kind of cedar bushes behind the building. Uh, you know, I'm wondering if if there's any plans to kind of remove those or trim those down or kind of what your thoughts were for any uh, updates behind the building. Absolutely not. <laughs> I think those are the best, uh, most effective screen we've got. Sure. Um, we did some trimming down close to the ground um, so that our cameras could see clearly back there so that we could you know, know what was happening um, in the, in the back of, uh, in the back of the property. Okay. So that was the only, that was the only clearing. What we've done so far is pretty much all we're going to do is for landscaping the back. Okay, great. Uh, that answers my question. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for being a good neighbor. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? I do. Yeah. I was looking at uh, for the roofing that's going to be on this building, you mentioned a double rolled roofing. Uh, so that roofing is the previous uh, permit, not for this current permit. So what's on this? What's on the current? So there's no roofing on the. You're not going to be doing any. I mean, this would be a flat roof, flat membrane roof, on the. But just that's only on this portion. This this portion will be a flat roof. There's nothing over the main. Of the no, so there is, but it does mention roofing in one of the yeah. one of the previous permits that was. Uh, that was I don't know if it's still open. I've been trying to been trying hard to close a lot of these permits, but I think it was just listed in the. In the um, list of permits in the, on prior, the documents, prior permits. It says prior permits replace asphalt roof with membrane. So there's a membrane roof on the main body of that okay. building, and there's no intention. I'm just looking at longevity of materials, and I was thinking, well, you can expect that year, though. No, no, it's, it has a, has a membrane roof on the main okay. roof now, and then we would put a membrane on, the, on that flat. Uh, questions? Um, Say anything on the aspect of thing for it? Um, Eric is the project manager oh. I, I did find um, newspaper accounts that um, when this building was under construction, a fourth story was added that had not been permitted. It was only board of adjustment called in the architect who was Julian Goodrich to provide testimony. I thought it was Marshall. That's Julian. the that's the 79 drawings. That's why I think it's 79. So the, the I, drawings are 79. I only know because I found these documents when we found old zoning permits in the attic of City Hall and I filed them then. So uh, this, pro this project is not without some history. Okay. So was it in 79? Maybe they changed yeah. the siding and did the front screen or something? Maybe? It was earlier than that. The screening. Story and 
Yeah, we're all set. Yeah, we're going to close the public hearing. Thank okay, you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I uh, really appreciate your time. I appreciate all the staff's time. I know. It's been we'll probably delivered today. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more item on the agenda that is. Um, <clears throat> Here's the two Asian streets. Oh, yeah, applicant uh, here. Neil Scott. <clears throat> have a seat. And I know Mark and Karen are here to speak on this. Is there anybody else in the public wishing to speak on uh, 52 Isham Street? So can you raise your hand? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Um, but anybody on Zoom? No. Okay, so and you are. Your name? Uh, I'm Nils Scott. Nils. As you guys. My brother, Karen, do you want to, three of you want to raise your hand and you swear to tell the truth and the whole truth on pain of penalty of perjury? Yeah. Okay. So um, we have an application in front of us uh, from staff comments. Uh, what was yours? Sure. Um, so I, I bought this property uh, two and a half years ago and uh, I've been doing, it's a two bedroom, or sorry, two unit, three bedrooms on each floor, duplex right now. Um, I've been doing a significant amount of improvements uh, to the interior over, uh, over that period of time with tenants as well. Um, I own or occupy it on the second floor. Um, and so in November of 2021, when I bought it, I uh, applied for permitting to condition the attic um, for some background, I'm a local electrician. I do a variety of work that I needed storage, et cetera. Um, so we went forward, conditioned that uh, spray foam, really improved the environmental stain uh, footprint, um, and then uh, applied for a permit for a bathroom up there, or modified the permit rather, with this was with Ryan Morris at the time. Um, and the the real, where the problems began, I guess, is we needed to have external access in the rear. Um, and once we started to pick apart the rear second floor porch uh, roof, there are a significant amount of rot, um, variety of other issues. So you'll see there's quite a few permits open on the property right now. Some of them are completely irrelevant to this application to the attic, such as um, working on a bathroom and uh, doing some changes to a kitchen, et cetera. Uh, but then we learned we had to cover this and it seemed to make more sense at the time to uh, extend the roof, changing it from a hip to a gable, which seems to be a, a point of contention um, as opposed to having just a freestanding structure above the stairwell. And so on, on nights like tonight, uh, protecting that stairwell from snow has been pretty significant. Um, and then so, uh, just to clarify, sure. So the original roof was hip on the back. It was hip and dormer. Yep. And when you originally insulated it, was it still hip? It was. And right. then you changed it from hip to gable. Yep, and extended the ridge line through the rear. Yeah. Um, evenly or only evenly to the rear, right? Both Correct. Right. Yep. It's uh, you know it is uh, standing seam metal but it's almost a slate color. It, it looks good in my opinion, not agree with degrees, but. That was a permitted thing? Yes. Yeah. And that is the same thing as the it's slate roof. Yep. So it goes from metal to slate. It does. Yep. Um, and so that's a covered open porch. Um, and so that was finished roughly in the spring or the rough. I, I want to know that the rear, it's, it's, a, it's a construction right now, so it doesn't look beautiful. Um, that's why I'm here today. We really want to close it all up and uh, get all that trim done in the spring. And so last spring, when this bonus came on my radar, um, it was always a hope of mine one day uh, financially uh, allowing to completely gut that attic and turn it into a third unit. And so this is now where we stand. So, so basically, that's you want to finish it with the matching the elevation that you present here for the for the building, and have it be a um, uh, 
additional unit and this, what was the criteria for that having additional units is it's a discretionary review <laughs> if a rehabilitation is done following the standards of section five or I think I think the purpose of that section is to encourage the rehabilitation. So it's not just got yeah, a historic structure and you can put a third unit in. It's sure. Yeah. You put a third unit in and quid pro quo, so to speak, is that you actually restore building yeah. something that's historic. Yeah, yeah so, so we're planning to say a little more about sure. That. Yeah, sorry, I should have touched on that. Um so the front of the building, we're planning to remove the asbestos. And below the asbestos is a uh, clapboard that's in pretty good shape. So we want to restore that. Um, repair all the fascias on this front uh, lower porch deck. Remove the, when I bought it three years ago, the owner just put on a sloppy uh, railing with pressure treated wood that's uh, just to sell it. And so we want to remove all that, restore it, um, and then put garden beds in, uh, where that lattice material is and build a new stair. Up. So the railing that's there is there now. That's a pressure treated railing, okay. painted white. Yeah. And you're going to restore it to. We're going to just remove that to uh, exactly. You can see sort of halfway where the railing is is the original. So we were going to rebuild that, looking identical to cedar. The existing railing? Um, in the top left, if, if you can zoom in. Oh, oh, so that is the existing railing, the original. Uh, railing. Yeah, but it, maybe if you're able to zoom in, you can see that the second half, they, they essentially just extended the existing railing that's in pretty yeah. poor shape. There's some rod, yeah. et cetera. So that whole front face, we want to uh, restore and add some additional stuff such as the, the garden beds and uh, completely new uh, stairs up to that boarding. And the siding, when you're all done, you're done with the original wood siding? You know, for the front? Yes. And what about the side? I didn't see a note about the side too. Yeah, so the side, the asbestos is in very good shape and it's uh, only a few feet off of the neighbors. So we were uh, hoping to keep that. And you also can't see it much at all from the street or from the rear. And then the rear face in the bottom left that's had mo most of the construction would be all new siding. So top right photograph, that's the side that's near the, that's the side you're replacing. Nope. Right no, we would be replacing the top left. Just the, just the west side. Yeah, so everything looks straight, it would look good. And then the sides of the house are in pretty good shape. Uh, we're gonna replace all of the window trims with wood. Um, those are in rough shape. The window trims or the windows themselves? The window trims. The windows were replaced about seven years ago, but the sills and trims were, they looked to never have been replaced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. talking about the, yeah wood storms? Yeah. Wood storms and wood windows? Is that what you're um, the existing windows are a slurry of wood and vinyl. Or, yeah, it's metal vinyl material. I mean, a mixture of some of wood, some of vinyl. Yeah, way. they didn't seem to replace every window. Um, the sides of the home have been replaced, though, pretty consistently in this well. The roof is a slate roof, except for the roof right there. Yeah, and I have, uh, I had it uh, completely restored. Um, the slate roof. Yeah, and it's in great shape. I have a report um, on one of the permits that says it should have a good half century, and at least, yeah. Mary, Aunt Mary, this is your project? Yes, it is. So I'm trying to understand the 125% allowance. Um, so if the language is gross floor area, would we typically include attic space, unfinished attic space in the gross floor area? Gross floor area as it's defined is area that is occupied, occupied human habitation. So okay. unfinished basements would not count, okay. unfinished attics would not count. Gross floor area is occupied. So this one's a little bit complicated. It was a progression of work here. Yeah. So when you were calculating the gross floor area, did you 
include the portion of the attic that was that point, I guess, considered habitable? I'm trying to figure out how to treat yeah. that area because it wasn't <clears throat> wasn't a unit Correct. that it was finished. Also, by definition, habitable space excludes storage and bathrooms. Okay. Well, only by definition. It's, it's been several weeks since I wrote the staff report, but um, I believe the calculation did include what the assessor recognized as storage space. Well, so bathrooms are not included. By the zoning code, bathrooms, hallways, storage areas are considered. But it's habitable for one to those four. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out how denominator denominator. Yeah, so we're talking about two point five percent. Terms of the, the amount that you use seemed to hide just based on frankly my own house and what square footage was on the first looking inside. So I would certainly be willing to revisit it, but it would have been those areas that were identified as places or area that was habitable. Seems like, in my mind, then it should only the the, the denominator two. should only include the gross floor area of the first and second, yeah. and, and then. We should figure out what we're adding is more than 120. There's also something that's more than 125 percent of that. Is that right? That sounds logical. Yeah. It's, it's funny thing with that calculation is how if bathrooms aren't covered as habitable space, then are they a part of the yeah. added space or they're not part of the added space? So I mean, build this space for most of the second, but then you add bathrooms after that space. Yeah. I don't know, and I'll be blunt. I'm, I'm also not 100% sure that the way the ordinance is written, I'm not sure I would have written it this way, but I'm not sure that it, the gross floor area, it, it talks about an expansion of the structure, I think, not necessarily the gross floor area. So I just I want to understand an expansion of, of up to a total of 25%. Yeah, gross floor area. So I don't know if you interpret expansion to mean expanding the building or the gross floor area. Does that another that interesting dimension is of this is the zoning code is very different from the building code. But the zoning code doesn't recognize the bathroom on the third floor as habitable space. But the creation of that required, according to the applicant, required the egress by the building, which spurred the application for the rear staircase. Yeah. So this was a concatenation of responses that ultimately resulted in this request for a third floor unit. And the third floor unit, the other question I had is it otherwise would meet building code requirements because it seems like a very sharp peak and low overhead. It, so I just want to make sure does. We're not, it does. It does. It will have to meet um, life safety code as well and sprinkling is required for third floor units. But we I, have to agree that um, for this building that 4,785 square feet seems pretty big. That's something that seems off in the calculation. It seems like we should go back to what's the first floor and second floor with a gross floor area. Make sure we have that number right so that we know yeah, how know. much can be expanded. So my house is only 2,500 square foot. How much is it? How, on the accessory unit? Can't be more than what? 700 square feet up there. So the, the expansion is talking. It's only expansion on here is described as 977 square feet. Does, does that include the covered porch? The first, the assessor provides the first floor is 1,065 feet. The second floor is 977. 
and the attic with finished space is defined as 488 uh, feet. So I, I have a question about the, the bathroom that was previously added to the attic. What unit was that a part of when it was added? Um, so the bathroom hasn't actually been fully added. We've been on a, a pretty big pause in anticipation maybe of, of getting this bonus. But the idea uh, was to provide a bathroom for the second floor unit because it doesn't have much of a living room scenario uh, as well as a, a really rundown bathroom. And the uh, location of it in the attic is right by the stairwell that connects to the second floor. So it, uh, it was convenient. So that was the original plan is that you were adding a bathroom to the second unit, but now you're looking for to split that off as a third unit. Yeah, it was essentially my thinking. So you guys understand was it was going to be a, a storage hybrid spot for my personal business, essentially, um, and also give us uh, a little more uh, luxury in, in our bathroom. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, just to understand, how, how is one access a third or unit? So the rear stairwell would be the main, the main, um, really the only egress if it's a separate unit. I, I would probably owner occupy it for quite a few years and I rent out to peers and, and colleagues really. So there's also an interior stairwell that connects. So it's almost giant unit if you wanted it to be, but the idea would be to separate it completely. Yeah. So, so there is an internal staircase. There is, yeah. Uh, to keep it to code though, we are sprinkling every single floor, including the basement, so that that internal staircase could be closed up. Can you, I don't know, Mary, can you give me those numbers again on the- Yes, where, or maybe you're just doing, doing my math here yeah, as we're okay. talking. <laughs> so I'm looking at the assessor's property database online, and they provide that area of the attic with finished space as being 488.5. Uh, do they There's, count it up to the five foot headroom, something like that? Well, they provide that the floor area is 977, but the finished area is 488.5. Yeah. Currently finished area. That's yeah. how they're recording it. Yeah. First floor, 1,065 square feet. Second floor, 977 square feet. That includes, though, what zoning does not consider habitable in terms of hallways and bathrooms. Like, we don't have a way to subtract that. It says gross floor area. I don't know why this, why would you take that? It, 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 yeah, I don't know why I was thinking it's some gross, floor, gross floor is. Well, I come to a total there of 2,530.5 square feet. 125 would be um, 3263. That's um, yeah, so that's what you could go up to, and the four would be 25, 30 plus the four, whatever it is that for the third floor. Yeah, 18 percent. Old math. I'm just doing old math. New math. No, we're going to get started. Yikes. Um, we have neighbors who would like to comment. Maybe hear from them. Okay. Um, yeah. It's just helping. My name is Karen Long, and we own 73 North Willard, which is behind this property since 2004. And we live around the corner on Henry Street, so we spend a lot of time doing yard work and maintaining the property. And we really love this property that we own. And actually, we first bought it. Our daughter lived there with her grandchildren children and my son-in-law. So this has been upsetting to me because, I, and we had a great relationship with the previous owner, but I'll tell you my story. So 
The landlord of 52 Eichen Street, the new landlord, has done nothing to restore or rehabilitate the exterior of his building, nor does he respect our CDO. He purchased the property in November 2021 and began parking in the backyard. I first spoke to one of his tenants and she smirked while I explained lock coverage and runoff. She was making eye contact with someone who was in the garage. The parking continued, so I sent a complaint to code enforcement. Soon after, I met the new owner in person and he was mad. He told me he paid half a million for the property and could do what he wants. I told him about zoning, lot coverage and runoff, and he said he knew about the lake because one of his tenants was an environmental studies major. So, you know, I, we didn't have a very good neighborly relationship. Anyway, I was very alarmed when construction began because the owner had cut a hole in the second floor porch of the roof. Like if you see that picture, it used to have a second floor. In fact, I have pictures that I've sent to Mary. It had a railing because it had a really cool open porch. And he put a stairway in that porch. And I don't know if you can show the pictures, somebody. Um, on up to the stairwell, made like a stair so he could be working on this gable. And the gable in the back of the house went from like a window to like a single door. And it still had the hip roof with the slate. And then, the, you know, it was a, that, but he changed it to a door, which I thought was weird. And I did write and ask about this. Um, and I was, uh, there's several emails in the file because I had exchanges with Bill Ward, Scott Gustin, and Ryan Morrison. They all confirmed the owner had a permit to add storage and a bathroom. And they emphasized there would be no additional living space. I thought that was weird. Who would put a stairway? and the outside, outside for storage, especially hearing now it's electrical storage. That's heavy stuff to carry to the third floor. Anyway, it seemed weird, but I was, and I bet there's five or six emails back and forth, um, different times as I sent pictures about what the state of the building was. Anyway, I was really concerned when the slate roof was removed because from my friends and neighbors, we have all been told you can't remove slate roofs. Um, and maybe that's a rule that's changed. But anyway, I was told he had a permit. So I did send more pictures because the backyard has been a wreck with trash, debris, everything. And there are people living there. And as a minimum housing thing, that didn't seem right. So again, People in the city told me, you know, I mean, not much was happening. And then we were away. I got home, huge stack of mail, and found out that this person was um, able to qualify or possibly qualify for a bonus um, because of this work that he was doing. I mean, in my mind, and I don't know, yeah, that's the back of the house on the left. That's how it looked before with the hip roof and the little dormer and the window and that nice back porch. Uh, in my mind, the house has been ruined because that's how it looks now. Um, and, you know, mainly because of the porch and the roof. And I was really upset that nobody informed me of this because there is a whole slew of email since the spring of 2022, I was communicating with code and zoning because I thought this seemed really odd, this whole construction. So I'm asking you to deny the request. The owner has been disrespectful and fraudulent and should not be rewarded. He's done nothing to preserve, maintain, or enhance his property. Karen Long. And Mike, I mean, we do have the letters they both wrote, so you yeah. don't read them both into the record, but comments you want to make. Yeah, I've done a little research, uh, I know there are people that know a lot more about 
Isham Street. And I and actually, perhaps somebody can tell me, is it Isham or Isham Street? <laughs> I just first time I heard Asian Street. I thought John is the expert. I used to live on that street. Yeah, I did. Is it Asian? Yeah. Thank you. So I did do a little research on on Asian, and I have a, I have some sense of its history. And again, I know folks in New York can 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 correct me on this, but but my sense is that Asian Street today is very different from Asian Street. Say when I moved to Burlington in the middle seventies and, and 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 before that, and and what I learned by doing a quick little bit of research today is that there are forty four residential units on Asian Street, and forty of them are are rental units, and uh, there are a couple of owner occupied uh, houses, and I guess uh, Mills is. Uh, is, is now in one of them, which I think is, is, is good and encouraging. Uh, but there are very few uh, owner occupied houses. Brian Sheena lives there, and uh, maybe a couple other people. The vast majority of these properties are owned by people who don't even live in Burlington. Some of them do live in Burlington, but, but not. But not there. So there was a time, as I understand it, when Isham Street was a lot like Henry Street is it's now, uh, kind of dominated by owner-occupied uh, houses with a few rentals and a and a, and a real mix of uh, residents, uh, multi-generational uh, babies and children and teenagers, people in mid-career and and people uh, retired people, so forth. The real, the real, what I would consider a healthy. Uh, mix uh, in the neighborhood. And what has happened in Isham uh, over the years is that, well, mainly it was, a, it was an economic opportunity to uh, to ex exploit the, the high demand for student rentals. And a lot of people uh, did very well by, by, by doing that. And in my mind, the city stood by and really advocated its responsibility to protect the neighborhood, enforce the code, and do all those things that would have prevented the neighborhood from being degraded. And I believe it's been significantly degraded. And I think it's a, it's a shameful state of affairs. It's, a, it's, it's, as I've said in one of my communications, uh, it's, a, uh, it's, it's, it's a poster child uh, for an epic failure in city planning. And it's happened not just in action, but there are other, other uh, streets that have been sacrificed all around Burlington. And I'm, I'm sure most of you are, uh, are, are, are aware of those. So for me, this case is not just about this case. It's about, it's, it's about a trend. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm surprised since we, we do have some regulations about historic preservation and so forth. I think it's highly ironic that, uh, that that this project could potentially qualify for a bonus unit due to historic preservation, because as I said, and press I've read as long to read this uh, again, but I think I noted that uh, it, it's it's the project is in many ways the opposite of historic uh, preservation, in that it's done all of the things that are prohibited uh, under. The, under the under the law and the regulations, uh, it says. Let me read a little bit of it. Uh, in some, this would be a wholly inappropriate and even a perverse use of the historic building rehabilitation bonus, and it specifically and egregiously violates the requirement that to qualify for that bonus, new additions. This is a quote now: new additions, exterior alterations, or related new construction will not destroy historic materials features and spatial relationships that characterize the property. This uh, renovation has been specifically the act term to destroying the, the hip roof, destroying the form of the hip roof. Now I've seen lots of hip roofs with uh with with with, with gable dormers and and and, and hip, I, actually I think the dormer that was on this one before was a, was actually a hip dormer. But uh, but I, I very, I've never seen actually until this one, uh, someone take a hip roof and, and, and put a big gable right from the top of it and totally replace the, the, the hip portion of the roof that was there before. And as a matter of fact, there's a property immediately behind my house on, on Henry Street. 
that has a beautiful slate hip roof like like the one that, that had been on the Ocean Street property. And, and I looked at it and just imagining if he were to put, you know, put a ridge line and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a hip roof there on the back, it would be, to my mind, a, a hideous thing for me to have to look at out my kitchen window every, every day. So um, I think the permits that have been issued for this property have been generous, liberal, uh, readily granted without much regard for historic materials or historic character uh, at all. And, and, and I think that is, uh, is, is more, than, more than sufficient and that uh, adding an additional unit as a bonus would be obscene, really. Uh, it, would be, it would be just contrary to any kind of rational approach to uh, city planning, historic preservation, uh, et cetera. So thank you uh, for your time. And as for the, the calculations that you guys were discussing at some, at some length, uh, those calculations as presented in the, uh, in, in the staff findings were based on uh, gross floor area, including even the basement. And that's how, how the calculation came to the one that, that Jeff thought seemed a little high, it was like almost a thousand, almost a thousand square feet. So that, that is definitely uh, kind of way, way off. And uh, I, don't, I don't think either the attic or the, uh, certainly the basement shouldn't count. I don't think the attic should count at all. Um, and I guess we're, maybe we're, the, the, the latest iteration is that you would count the habitable space. Or the, what, so there was already finished space in the, in the in the in the attic before this renovation began, is that correct? It had been approved. Yeah, right. It was one of the things we're struggling with is there are things that have already been approved. Here. Right. So I, and, and I, I sent a document kind of reviewing all the permits. Did people see that? Yeah. Um, and and right, one of those early permits did add. Um, I think it was two hundred forty square feet of habitable space to the to the attic for a bathroom and I feel like it's a very large bathroom uh, and uh, I'm surprised by that and then a later permit said there was no habitable space in the, in the, in the bathroom so there are quite a number of contradictions if you go through those um, those, those permits in, in sequence but I guess that's um, I guess that's my um, view thank you thanks Michael I think the definitions of these terms differed by who you're asking. The assessor's office provides a number for gross area, but they include decks, open porches, the garage, which we would not consider. We are guided by those particular definitions. The same thing here for habitable area. I think it depends on who's giving you the information. What I'm trying to figure out is how we interpret what's in what's in the ordinance and apply it consistently to the way we allow in the past. Understanding there's I don't think we would typically include something in the basement. Struggling with the fact this prior approval in this case to allow additional habitable space in the attic. The habitable space def the habitable space request was on the definition of the application. It was not in the issuance of the permit. But the habitable space added in the attic is not particularly relevant to the additional unit. I mean that that's a separate issue. They can well, you know, I, I guess to me it is because if we're including that whatever the number is, the 488 that's already in the attic. Then adding just the additional amount to make the whole attic a new unit. Maybe it's a number I can accept. Yeah. So yeah. I, I have a question for, for Mary on this application, though. Yes. Typically, uh, when we're looking at historic issues on buildings, um, we're dealing with the street presence, and oftentimes 
and people can change windows and do things on the rear of the building that's not considered um, contrary to the section regarding historic preservation. Am I wrong about that? Certainly our practice has been to allow greater flexibility on secondary elevations. So rear decks, rear porches, dormers, those have been seen more generously if they're not affecting the so Hence the uh, permit to change the roof line in the back of the building. <laughs> um, it, admittedly, I was not the project manager for this. He, um, Brian Morrison was the project manager. I have seen email exchanges relative to this. I believe that the slate roof is either being removed or in the process of being removed when uh, the code enforcement officer reached out to the applicant. Um, there is a very long list of exchanges with all the staff members with each one of these. This current application has not less than 30 um, exchanges in this review. So, um, despite the appearance that staff has not been engaged, we've been very engaged as this concatenation of permit requests have come. And I think that's why we're here today because um, I was a project, I am the project manager on this, and I pushed the applicant to say, you have defined in your plans a discrete unit. So you may apply under this bonus or your project will be denied because you are over density allowance. Um, so that's how we count today. Mary. You, I'm sorry, go ahead, Caitlin. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I have a question because this has come up a couple times recently where we're trying to review one zoning permit, but there's active work going on on other zoning permits and how have we like what is the typical process for that when they're so interrelated I find it very challenging to look at just this permit when there's ongoing work that's impacted by this permit I mean I don't I can't think of anything in the CDO that helps us with those decisions but it feels like these are really amendments to prior zoning permits rather than a separate permit when it's all related it's all one set of renovations well your question should be directed at the property owner on why we've had so many permit applications whether it was the intention to move in this direction or it was the default just as the changes were occurring i know that um, I was not included in the earlier complaints uh, that came to Bill Ward and Scott Gustin, um, but uh, Scott has assured me with those complaints, his response was, there is a permit for the work that's ongoing right now. Whether it was the roof extension, the rear staircase, um, or general work in the yard, that there were permits issued individually for the work that was ongoing. At this point in this review, uh, the expansion into the attic was intentional and uh, staff believed it was the clear intention to create a unit because a living space, a sleeping space, and a kitchen space were all illustrated. And um, the applicant was advised, if you intend to go this way, the only way you can get another unit is by asking for uh, the bonus provision because the site is maxed out under the density provisions right now. Yeah, I think that's fair that I can redirect part of a question. I think still what I would be curious to hear from you is like, at what point does staff give the direction that this is an amendment to a prior permit rather than a separate permit? Well, I think it. I think the project evolved as the work was ongoing. It, if we deny this permit under this, um, this historic preservation provision, the the rest of the permits are already open, so it'd still be 
basically this gabled roof, the bathroom slash storage area closing up the back would still be continuing work. It just couldn't be a dwelling unit. Is that correct? That's correct. They may continue the work that was approved. It was not appealed. I'm going to take Mary's advice and ask the applicant um, if you could take us back. What, because there are so many permits in such a short amount of time period, can you just give us a little bit of background on what happened in the process? What changed in terms of what the vision sure. was? Um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be the first to acknowledge it wasn't probably the best uh, plan from the beginning or it did evolve. It's my first home and um, contrary to their statement, I do care very much about it. This is everything I own. Um, it might not look beautiful right now, but I, I live there and I want it to. Um, and like Evan said, you know, the exterior changes, they've happened and um, I intend to wrap them up in the spring and it would be, you know, beneficial to the community, to us, uh, to, you know, leverage this space that's going to be conditioned as it is. And, uh, you know, the reason that I started was undoubtedly that I wanted a space that could be finished one day. Um, and so with, you know, I've, I've hired GVV architects and um, Mary has given me a lot of comment and input and helped me go back and forth through all these permits. And I hope the permits show how, uh, how much I do value pulling a permit for every little thing, whether it's changing an outlet or switching from a tub to a shower stall, I don't know. Caitlin, do you have any follow-up on that? No, thank you. Um, I, I guess just, I'm not sure it's a question, but I I can appreciate some of the frustration of this feeling like grief, and I feel like you're acknowledging that a little bit, like there was a long-term vision of getting yeah. to something, and it, Puts us as the reviewer in a difficult position when I just see it piecemeal. Yeah. Um, and frankly, frustrates me because it ties our hands a little bit. Yeah. And I really appreciate that you're you're living there on the street and in the house, and that is, as Michael indicated, good progression for that street, I think. Absolutely. Um, but, uh, it would be helpful for us as reviewers who can we will be transparent when they come in about what they're planning so we can understand and try to address these issues. So, Yeah, I want to be clear. I didn't plan or start this. I learned about the, the bonus didn't exist in 2021, I believe. Um, so I learned about it last spring, a month or two after it was available. You know, I, I dumped a lot of money into fitting and conditioning the space, as I like to call it, and improving the, the heating and electrical systems to, uh, you know, conform to that. But didn't have any intention of doing this probably for a decade. And it took a while because, you know, I, I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars to dump all at once. Um, but a lot has changed also, I want to say, now that I have an architect advising, money is there to finish this. Um, so this is really the only thing that's holding up. I, so I do have one just kind of on the historic preservation. So one of the things I think that was brought up is the the replacement of the slate roof in the rear. And it seems, I know slate roofs are expensive. Is is there a reason that you chose to go with a metal roof on that back dormer portion instead of continuing? I I know there's also, right, with historic preservation, you don't want it to pretend to be the structure or try to add historic details that are not there. But I'm, I'm just curious why you didn't consider yeah. going with slate um, initially. So that was a that that was almost a three month three month long like a permit process of Mary and I going back and forth with a bunch of other people. Um, it was a combination of of uh, cost and structural and structural ended up deciding after I had um, grant from Spit Rock Slate come do an assessment of the current roof and assessment of the structural capability. Uh, he deemed it it could not support slate. Yeah, so Mary had me have a whole, uh, what's the name of it, where I had the slate assessed, essentially. Um, so there's a pretty lengthy process involved with that. And one of the comments, there's a sounds like 
the yard right now is construction zone. Is that so? It's it's not the most beautiful. Um, I agree, and you know I, I disagree with your comments on my truck. I put my truck there to fill it up with trash as opposed to making a pile. Um, and uh, but I have very high hopes for the spring and for the summer when this is finished. Trust me, I have not enjoyed living there for the last two years. <laughs> I want to make it an enjoyable spot. You know, I'm, I'm close, if not friends, with every all six of my tenants. Yes. We utilize the backyard. I like Isham too. I agree with what Michael said about Isham. Yeah. Or Isham, sorry. <laughs> I always wondered that. I guess the only other thing I'd say is that if we approve this, it is conditioned also on doing all the other things. So it's not, it's not just finishing that space, but we're really like talking about meeting all the other conditions. Absolutely. Yeah, I have that. And then uh, we're sprinkling the entire building in June when the tenants are out. Um, you know, my, my laundry list is hundred, hundreds of bullets deep. <laughs> I have a question. Um, in the plan, and I believe the metal roof, there was a picture up there. Gable has already been done and it's new. I'm not sure why it didn't, couldn't support slate, but it said in the plans that there's going to be a dormer on the north side, I believe. Mm -hmm. That there's no dormer, but, the a shed dormer. But the, if the metal roof is already there and everything is there, then to tear that apart and put a dormer there, I don't know, it just seems. Uh, it's, it's a headroom requirement, and we wanted to keep the, you know, the, the number one priority was to keep the roof lines identical. And so if I had to put a, a dormer in, you know, it's not that hard to make a small cut in standing seam. And so it's not going to be a dormer like on the south side. It's a different dormer. It's a shed Correct. dormer. Very small. It's only to allow for, a, uh, for headroom. It's, it's maybe a foot of headroom or something. On the, north. Yeah. On the south side is a regular. The original. Yeah, yeah, yeah so no, I've seen it. That just seemed it's about awesome. about a foot of head what he's looking for. Yeah. yeah, it's not ideal. I and know. that the if there is a unit put up there, those people will come through the back up that stairway. If they so choose, there is an interior I, I don't want to get into okay. a discussion. All right. Okay, sure. sorry. Yeah. yeah. That would be up to the, the tenant. Okay. Um is there anything else on the board? Nope. I, I guess I just have, so I'm a little confused. And I mean, the you're planning potentially to add another unit, but the density limit in this area for residential medium wouldn't allow you to build another unit. And so I'm just kind of curious what your thought process there kind of as an end goal was were you just planning eventually like zoning would change or what? So this was uh, my my first choice that I thought was more practical was to build some sort of hybrid office up there. Uh, and I was thinking like a decade <laughs> far out. Um, this It just feels foolish to me to spend so much money for storage when the opportunity presented itself. And that's what's delayed it. You know, this was supposed to be finished well over a year ago, and that's what's delayed it. Um, yeah, I, I didn't build it with the intention of a unit per se, but the intention of habitable space like an office or a work area of some sort. Yeah, with a bathroom. So, so an extended the the second second floor. Floor. Yeah, and just so I live on the second unit right now, and that's plenty. So I was hoping that third unit could just be like a glorious living space, living room, work area, whatever. Yeah. Heated space. Okay. Evan. No, no more questions. That's very calm. His baby is standing here. <laughs> he's he's yeah, he's just eating right now. <laughs> Julian, any questions? So with that, we're gonna close public hearing.